When a crime is committed, it's the job of law enforcement to investigate and bring those responsible to justice. However, not all cases are solved immediately and some remain unsolved for years or even decades. These cases, known as cold cases, often haunt investigators and the loved ones of the victims for years. In this article, we'll take a closer look at 15 unsolved cold cases from different states in the USA. From mysterious disappearances to brutal homicides, these cases have stumped investigators and left families without closure. Despite the passage of time, these cases are not forgotten and authorities continue to search for answers. Join us as we delve into these haunting mysteries and try to uncover the truth behind these unsolved crimes. Number 15. Sherry Lynn Marler Sherry Lynn Marler's disappearance in 1984 was a traumatic event for her family and the community of Greenville, Alabama. Despite extensive searches and investigations, her case remains unsolved to this day, leaving her loved ones with unanswered questions and a lingering sense of loss. Sherry was last seen wearing a red t-shirt, blue shorts, and white sneakers when she disappeared. She had shoulder-length brown hair and brown eyes and stood around 14 tall, weighing approximately 80 pounds. Her disappearance sparked an intensive search by law enforcement and volunteers, with helicopters and tracking dogs scouring the surrounding area for any clues. Over the years, authorities have pursued various leads and suspects, but none have resulted in finding Sherry or bringing anyone to justice. Some theories suggest that she was abducted by a stranger, while others point to the possibility of foul play by someone close to her. Despite the passage of time, Sherry's family continues to hold out hope for answers and closure. They have worked tirelessly to keep her memory alive, organizing vigils and raising awareness about her case. In 2019, the Butler County Sheriff's Office reopened the investigation into Sherry's disappearance, hoping to uncover new information or leads that could bring her home or provide some form of resolution for her family. As of now, the investigation into Sherry's disappearance remains ongoing and anyone with information is urged to come forward and contact the Butler County Sheriff's Office or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Sherry's disappearance has left a lasting impact on the community of Greenville, Alabama. Her case has been featured in local and national media over the years, and her story has been shared on social media platforms to help keep the case in the public eye. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has also played a significant role in the investigation. The organization has provided resources and support to Sherry's family, worked with law enforcement to distribute flyers and posters, and used forensic technology to create age-progressed images of what Sherry may look like today. Sherry's disappearance is just one of many unsolved missing persons cases in Alabama and across the United States. The National Crime Information Center reports that as of December 31, 2020, there were 89,538 active missing person records in the United States. While some cases are resolved quickly, others remain open for years, leaving families and loved ones searching for answers. The search for Sherry Lynn Marler continues, and her family remains hopeful that one day they will find the answers they have been seeking for almost four decades. Number 14. The Investor The murders on the fishing boat Investor in Craig, Alaska, in 1982 shocked the community and captured national attention. The tragic incident occurred when the boat was docked in the town's harbour and the passengers were preparing for a new fishing season. The eight victims included the boat's owner, Mark Colthurst, his pregnant wife, Irene, their two children, Kimberly and John, and four teenage deckhands. They were all shot to death in their sleep, with the killer using a high-powered rifle to carry out the heinous act. After the murders, the killer fled the scene, and a massive manhunt ensued. Authorities quickly focused their investigation on a suspect, John Peel, who was the investor's former skipper, and an ex-convict with a history of violence. Peel had a financial dispute with Colthurst, and investigators believed he carried out the killings in a fit of rage. However, despite mounting evidence against Peel, including a confession he later recanted, he was ultimately acquitted of the murders. The case remains unsolved to this day, leaving the families of the victims without closure and the community still grappling with the tragedy that shook them to their core. The investor tragedy highlighted the harsh realities of life in Alaska's fishing industry, where isolated communities and dangerous working conditions can create a breeding ground for violence and crime. The incident also underscored the importance of effective law enforcement in remote areas, where investigations can be particularly challenging and time-consuming. Despite the passage of time, the memory of the investor tragedy lives on in the hearts of the victims' families and the Alaska community as a whole, a haunting reminder of the fragility of life and the devastating consequences of senseless violence. The investor tragedy also had a lasting impact on the fishing industry in Alaska. The incident raised awareness about the dangers and risks associated with the industry, particularly for small-scale fishing operations. 
It highlighted the need for better safety regulations and security measures to protect fishermen and their families from violence and other hazards. In response to the tragedy, Alaska implemented new laws and regulations aimed at improving safety and security in the fishing industry. These included requirements for emergency communication and navigation systems, mandatory safety training for crew members, and increased law enforcement presence in remote fishing communities. The tragedy also inspired a renewed sense of community and resilience among the people of Craig and other fishing towns in Alaska. In the aftermath of the incident, locals banded together to support the victims' families and each other, demonstrating the strong bond and spirit of solidarity that are often a hallmark of rural communities. Despite the passage of time, the investor tragedy continues to be a subject of interest and fascination for many, with numerous books, articles and documentaries exploring the case and its implications. Number 13. Paul and Robin Burgett. The murder of Paul and Robin Burgett in 1978 was a shocking and tragic event that shook the city of Phoenix, Arizona. The details of the crime are chilling. When Chad Burgett returned home from a weekend trip with his mother, he found his sister dead in their family home with multiple stab wounds. The investigation into the murder was extensive, but initially yielded few leads. However, police eventually arrested and charged a man named Charles Schmidt who was known in the area for his eccentric and disturbing behaviour. Schmidt was eventually convicted of the murder and sentenced to life in prison. The case attracted national attention and remains a notable chapter in Arizona's history of crime and justice. Beyond the specifics of the case itself, the murder of Paul and Robin Burgett is a reminder of the devastating impact that violent crime can have on individuals, families and communities. It is a testament to the importance of justice and the ongoing efforts to prevent and address such tragedies. In the aftermath of the murder, the Burgett family was left devastated and struggling to come to terms with their loss. Pauline, who was only 16 years old at the time of her death, was described as a kind and caring young woman with a bright future ahead of her. Her tragic murder cut short her life and left her family and friends grappling with grief and trauma. The case also highlighted the importance of community support and the role of law enforcement in solving violent crimes. The investigation into Pauline's murder was a joint effort between local and state law enforcement agencies who worked tirelessly to gather evidence and identify a suspect. Their dedication and perseverance eventually led to the arrest and conviction of Charles Schmid bringing a sense of closure and justice to the Burgett family and the wider community. Today, the memory of Paul and Robin Burgett lives on through the continued efforts of law enforcement and advocates for victims of violent crime. The tragedy of her death serves as a reminder of the need for ongoing efforts to prevent and address such crimes and to support the victims and families affected by them. Number 12. Morgan Nick. Morgan Nick's disappearance on June 9, 1995 remains one of the most haunting cases in the history of Arkansas. Morgan, who was just six years old at the time, vanished from a little league baseball game in Alma, Arkansas. The ball field was located in a secluded area, surrounded by woods, making it the perfect location for a potential abductor to grab a child without being seen. The details of Morgan's disappearance are harrowing. She was playing with other children near her mother, Colleen Nick, who had turned away for only a moment to tend to her other child. When she turned back around, Morgan was gone. Witnesses reported seeing a man watching Morgan and other children play, and he was seen talking to Morgan before she disappeared. Later, a man matching that same description was seen driving away from the ballpark in a red truck. Since that fateful day, Morgan Nick has never been found. Despite numerous tips and leads, law enforcement agencies have been unable to locate her or identify the person responsible for her abduction. Her case has garnered national attention and her image has been circulated on billboards, flyers and even on milk cartons in an effort to bring her home. The investigation into Morgan Nick's disappearance has been ongoing for over 25 years. The case has been examined by multiple law enforcement agencies and the FBI, but unfortunately no breakthrough has been made in the case. Morgan's mother, Colleen Nick, has dedicated her life to finding her daughter and has even helped to create the Morgan Nick Foundation, which works to prevent child abductions and support the families of missing children. The disappearance of Morgan Nick is a heartbreaking reminder of the dangers that children face in our society. It is also a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, as the Nick family and law enforcement agencies have never given up hope that she will be found. As of now, the case remains unsolved, and Morgan Nick's family and the community continue to pray for answers and for her safe return. Over the years, there have been a few promising leads in the case of Morgan Nick's disappearance. In 2002, a convicted child killer named Tonya Lee Slatton confessed to abducting and killing Morgan but later recounted her confession. She remains a person of interest in the case, but her involvement has not been definitively proven. In 2010, investigators announced a new lead in the case. They had received a tip about a possible suspect who had been in the area at the time of Morgan's disappearance. This man had a criminal history, including charges of assault and kidnapping, 
However, despite an extensive investigation, no conclusive evidence linking him to Morgan's disappearance was found. In 2020, on the 25th anniversary of Morgan's disappearance, the FBI announced a new push to solve the case. They released a new age progression photo of what Morgan may look like as an adult and urged anyone with information to come forward. The FBI also announced a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for Morgan's disappearance. The case of Morgan Nick remains one of the most high-profile missing children cases in the United States. Her disappearance has had a profound impact on her family and the community, and the search for answers continues. Number 11. The Zodiac Killer The Zodiac Killer is one of the most notorious serial killers in American history, and his reign of terror in California between the 1960s and 1970s left an indelible mark on the state's psyche. Despite a massive manhunt and investigation involving numerous law enforcement agencies, the Zodiac Killer was never caught, and his true identity remains a mystery to this day. The first known attack attributed to the Zodiac Killer occurred on December 20, 1968, when he shot and killed two high school students in Benicia, California. Over the next few years, he would go on to commit a string of murders and attempted murders in Northern California, including the shooting of a young couple at Lake Herman Road in 1969 and the brutal stabbing of a couple at Lake Berryessa in 1970. Perhaps what made the Zodiac Killer so terrifying was his penchant for taunting the police and the public. He would send cryptic messages to local newspapers, often written in a strange code that took investigators months to decipher. In one letter, he claimed responsibility for killing a cab driver and included a piece of the victim's bloody shirt as proof. Despite the intense scrutiny of law enforcement and the media, the Zodiac Killer was never caught. There were many suspects over the years, including Arthur Lee Allen, a convicted child molester and known Zodiac enthusiast, but none of the evidence against them was ever conclusive. The case of the Zodiac Killer remains unsolved to this day, but it continues to capture the public imagination. Numerous books, movies, and TV shows have been produced about the case, and amateur sleuths continue to pour over the evidence in the hopes of cracking the code and identifying the killer. Despite the passage of decades, the legacy of the Zodiac Killer lives on in the collective memory of California and the wider world. In addition to his cryptic messages to the media, the Zodiac Killer also sent letters to individuals, including one to the San Francisco Chronicle that contained a cipher that, when solved, claimed that he was killing people because they were a lot of fun to kill. This letter also contained the infamous phrase, this is the Zodiac speaking, which would become his trademark. Despite his apparent love of attention, the Zodiac Killer was notoriously elusive, and his methods of attack were often unpredictable. In one instance, he called the police to report a shooting and then calmly waited at the scene until they arrived. In another, he approached a couple on a secluded beach and shot them both at close range. The Zodiac Killer's reign of terror came to an abrupt halt in the mid-1970s, and he was never heard from again. Although there were occasional sightings and potential suspects over the years, the case remains officially unsolved. The legacy of the Zodiac Killer is complex and multifaceted. On the one hand, he is remembered as a cold-blooded killer who terrorized Northern California for years. On the other hand, his notoriety has also elevated him to the status of a cultural icon, inspiring countless works of fiction and true crime documentaries. Despite the passage of time, the hunt for the Zodiac Killer continues to captivate the public imagination. Some investigators believe that advances in DNA testing may one day help solve the case, while others argue that the killer's identity may remain a mystery forever. Number 10. John Bennett Romsey The murder of John Bennett Romsey shocked the nation and remains unsolved to this day. The six-year-old was a pageant queen, known for her beauty and talent on stage. Her death was a tragic end to a young life full of potential. The circumstances surrounding John Bennett's death were highly unusual and raised many questions. The ransom note, for example, was unusual in length and demanded a specific amount of money. The note also contained handwriting that was later found to match that of Patsy Ramsey, John Bennett's mother. The family's behaviour following the discovery of the note was also questionable, with the parents declining to cooperate with law enforcement and hiring a public relations firm to manage their image. The investigation into John Bennett's death was highly publicised, with many theories and suspects being proposed over the years. Some have suggested that an intruder broke into the home and committed the crime, while others have pointed to family members as potential suspects. Despite numerous investigations, however, the case remains unsolved. The death of John Bennett Romsey remains a haunting reminder of the tragedies that can occur even in the most seemingly idyllic of settings. The case has inspired books, documentaries and television specials and continues to fascinate and mystify the public. It is a reminder of the importance of justice and the tragic consequences that can occur when it is denied. 
The case of John Bennett Ramsey has also raised questions about child beauty pageants and the exploitation of children in the entertainment industry. Some argue that the pressure and emphasis on appearance in these pageants can lead to unhealthy and dangerous situations for young children. The tragedy of John Bennett's death has spurred conversations about the need for increased regulation and oversight of child beauty pageants. Despite the lack of resolution in the case, it continues to be a high-profile investigation. In 2019, the Boulder Police Department announced that they would be using new technology to re-examine DNA evidence in the case in the hopes of finally identifying John Bennett's killer. The legacy of John Bennett Ramsey lives on, not only in the ongoing investigation into her death, but also in the conversations and debates that her case has sparked. Number 9. Mary Badaracco. Mary Badaracco's disappearance from Sherman, Connecticut in 1984 has remained a cold case for over three decades. Her mysterious disappearance has left her family and authorities searching for answers and justice for years. The circumstances surrounding her disappearance have raised suspicion and intrigue, leading many to speculate about what might have happened to her. Mary's car was found parked in the driveway of her home with the driver's side severely damaged, which immediately raised red flags. It appeared as if her car had been in an accident, but there was no evidence of any other vehicle involved. Mary's wedding ring and car keys were found on the kitchen counter, which indicated that she had returned home but had not stayed for long. This led investigators to believe that she had left her home willingly, but with whom and why remained a mystery. Despite extensive investigations and numerous leads, Mary's whereabouts remain unknown. Her family has been tirelessly searching for answers, and her daughter has been actively pursuing justice for her mother's disappearance. In 2010, Mary's case was reopened and classified as a homicide investigation, and several suspects were questioned. However, no arrests have been made, and the case remains unsolved. The disappearance of Mary Badaracco is one of many cold cases that have puzzled investigators in Connecticut. Despite advancements in forensic science and technology, there are still many mysteries surrounding this case, leaving Mary's family and loved ones to wonder what happened to her on that fateful day in 1984. Over the years, various theories have emerged regarding Mary's disappearance. Some believe that she may have been involved in organized crime, as her husband, Dominic Badaracco, was known to have ties to the mafia. Others speculate that she may have been the victim of foul play at the hands of someone she knew, possibly even her husband or someone he was associated with. There have also been suggestions that Mary may have simply decided to leave her life behind and start anew elsewhere. Despite the lack of concrete evidence and leads, Mary's case has not been forgotten. In 2021, the Connecticut State Police released a statement indicating that they were still actively investigating Mary's disappearance and seeking information from the public. They offered a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anyone involved in her disappearance. Mary's daughter, Beth Profter, has been a vocal advocate for her mother and has worked tirelessly to keep her case in the public eye. She has utilized social media and other platforms to raise awareness about Mary's disappearance and to encourage anyone with information to come forward. Her efforts have been recognized by many and she has become a spokesperson for families of missing persons. The disappearance of Mary Badaracco is a tragedy that has impacted her family and community for decades. The lack of closure and answers has been a source of pain and frustration, but Mary's case remains open and investigators continue to search for answers. Number 8. Jane Marie Pritchard the death of Jane Marie Pritchard in 1986 remains a mysterious and unsolved case in Delaware's history. Pritchard was a promising young botanist pursuing her master's degree at the University of Maryland and had visited the Blackbird State Forest in Delaware many times for her research. She had a keen interest in studying the unique flora and fauna of the area and was known to be passionate about her work. On September 19, 1986, Pritchard headed to the forest as usual, but her detailed note suddenly stopped around 10 a.m. She had told a friend that she planned to work in the forest until noon before returning home. However, when she failed to return, her family and friends grew worried and contacted the authorities. The next day, Pritchard's partially clothed body was found in the forest, with a single gunshot wound to her back. Her camera and other personal belongings were missing, and there was no apparent motive for the crime. The police initially treated the case as a possible hunting accident, but the evidence did not support this theory. Despite an intensive investigation and several leads, the case remains unsolved to this day and no suspects have ever been identified. Over the years, there have been several rumors and speculations about the possible motive and suspects, but none have been substantiated. The tragic and mysterious death of Jane Marie Pritchard has left her family and the community devastated, and the case remains a haunting reminder of the dangers that lurk in even the most tranquil and beautiful places. The investigation into Pritchard's death was initially carried out by the Delaware State Police, who worked tirelessly to solve the case. They conducted numerous interviews, searched for potential suspects, and even used a helicopter to survey the area from above. 
Despite their efforts, the police were unable to solve the case, and it remains a cold case to this day. The case has been reviewed multiple times over the years, but no new leads or evidence have surfaced. Pritchard's death has had a lasting impact on the community, and her family and friends continue to seek closure and justice for her. In 2019, the Delaware State Police held a press conference, announcing a renewed effort to solve the case and appealing to the public for any information that may help. The press conference reignited public interest in the case, and it was featured in several media outlets, including podcasts and TV shows. However, despite the renewed interest in the police's efforts, the case remains unsolved. The death of Jane Murray Pritchard is a reminder of the importance of safety when conducting research in remote areas and the dangers that lurk in even the most peaceful environments. Number 7. A Triple Murder in Tallahassee The tragic case of the Sims family murders in Tallahassee, Florida remains one of the most baffling and unsolved cases in American criminal history. Robert and Helen Sims and their 12-year-old daughter Joy were brutally killed in their home on the night of October 22, 1966. Their bodies were found bound, gagged, stabbed and shot, indicating a vicious and calculated attack. Despite an intensive investigation and numerous leads, the case has remained unsolved for more than 50 years. The police have struggled to piece together the events of that fateful night, and no suspects have ever been named or charged. The Sims family murders have haunted the Tallahassee community and have been the subject of countless theories and speculations. Some have suggested that the killings were linked to organized crime, while others have pointed to a possible connection to the civil rights movement, which was gaining momentum in the area at the time. Some have even speculated that the murders were committed by a cult or a group of Satanists. Over the years, the police have revisited the case several times, hoping to uncover new evidence or leads that could help solve the mystery. In 2014, the case was reopened by the Tallahassee Police Department, and a new team of detectives was assigned to investigate. However, despite their efforts, the case remains unsolved. The Sims family murders remain a tragic and shocking reminder of the violence that can occur within seemingly peaceful communities. Despite the passage of time, the case has not been forgotten, and investigators continue to search for answers in the hope of bringing closure to the families of the victims. The brutal and senseless nature of the crime has left many people puzzled and disturbed, and the fact that the killer or killers have never been identified has only added to the mystery. The Sims family were well-respected members of their community, and their death sent shockwaves throughout the city. Over the years, various theories and rumours have emerged about who may have been responsible for the murders. Some have suggested that it was a revenge killing, possibly linked to Robert Sims' work as a professor at Florida State University. Others have speculated that it was a burglary gone wrong and that the killer or killers were surprised by the family's presence in the house. Despite the many leads that have been pursued over the years, the case has remained cold and it is not clear whether it will ever be solved. However, investigators have not given up hope and new technologies and forensic techniques are constantly being developed that could one day help to crack the case. In the meantime, the memory of the Sims family continues to be honoured by their community and their tragic deaths serve as a reminder of the need for justice and the importance of finding closure for the families of victims of violent crimes. Number 6. Vanessa Honey Malone Vanessa Honey Malone's life was tragically cut short in 2012 when she was shot while visiting her friend's apartment in Stone Mountain, Georgia. At just 18 years old, Honey had her whole life ahead of her, but it was taken away in a senseless act of violence. According to reports, Honey had spent the day at work before telling her mother, Flora, that she was going out for the evening. However, not long after, Flora heard gunshots coming from a neighbouring apartment complex and tried calling Honey to check on her. Sadly, Honey didn't answer the phone. When Flora arrived at the scene, she found that her daughter had been shot and was lying on the ground. Honey was rushed to the hospital, but she died from her injuries soon after. The shooting was a devastating blow to Honey's family and friends, who were left to grapple with the senseless loss of such a young and promising life. It also sparked outrage in the community and brought attention to the issue of gun violence in Georgia. Despite extensive investigations by local authorities, the person or persons responsible for Honey's death have not been identified or brought to justice. This has only added to the pain and frustration felt by her loved ones, who continue to seek answers and closure. The case serves as a stark reminder of the toll that gun violence takes on communities across the United States and the urgent need for action to address this crisis. Until meaningful steps are taken to reduce gun violence, more families like Honey's will continue to suffer the devastating consequences of this epidemic. In the years since Honey's death, her family has worked tirelessly to keep her memory alive and advocate for change. They have organised community events and fundraisers to raise awareness about gun violence and support other families who have lost loved ones to similar tragedies. 
Honey's mother, Flora, has become a prominent voice in the movement for gun safety, speaking out about the need for stronger laws and regulations to prevent such senseless acts of violence. She has also worked to provide support and resources to other families who have experienced similar losses. Despite the lack of progress in identifying Honey's killer, her family remains hopeful that justice will eventually be served. They continue to urge anyone with information about the shooting to come forward and help bring closure to their painful ordeal. Honey's story is just one of countless examples of the devastating impact of gun violence in America. While the issue is complex and multifaceted, it is clear that more must be done to address it. This includes not only efforts to reduce the number of guns in circulation, but also measures to improve mental health services, address systemic inequalities, and promote a culture of peace and non-violence. As we work toward a safer and more just society, we must not forget the countless lives that have been lost to gun violence, including Honey Malone and so many other young people whose futures were cut tragically short. Number 5. The Lewiston Clarkston Occurrences The string of murders and disappearances that occurred in the Lewiston Clarkston metropolitan area between 1979 and 1982 has become one of the most notorious unsolved mysteries in Idaho's history. Despite numerous investigations and inquiries, no one has ever been charged or identified as the perpetrator of these crimes. The first disappearance was that of Christina Nelson, a 21-year-old who vanished in June 1981 after leaving her job at a local restaurant. Her body was discovered the following April, when a group of hunters stumbled upon her remains in a shallow grave in the nearby hills. She had been strangled to death. The second victim was Jacqueline Brandy Miller, a 19-year-old who disappeared in September 1981 after leaving her job at a local convenience store. Her body was found two months later, also in a shallow grave, in the same area where Nelson had been found. Like Nelson, Miller had been strangled to death. The third victim was Kirsten David, a 22-year-old who disappeared in June 1982 after leaving her job at a local bar. Her body was discovered two weeks later, also in a shallow grave, in a remote area outside of town. David had been beaten and strangled to death. The fourth victim was Stephen Pearsall, a 35-year-old who disappeared in May 1982 after leaving his girlfriend's house. His car was found abandoned a few days later, but he was never seen again. The fifth victim was Christina White, a 12-year-old who disappeared in April 1982 while walking home from a friend's house. She was last seen by a witness who reported seeing her speaking to a man in a light-coloured van. Despite an extensive search, White was never found. Although the investigations into these murders and disappearances have continued for decades, no one has ever been charged or convicted for the crimes. The case has been the subject of numerous books, documentaries and podcasts and has garnered national attention. It remains an open case and investigators continue to follow up on leads and new information in the hopes of solving this mystery and bringing closure to the families of the victims. Over the years, a number of suspects have emerged in connection with the Idaho murders, but none have ever been definitively linked to the crimes. One person of interest was a man named Richard Caruso, who was known to have been in the area at the time of the murders and had a history of violent behaviour. However, Caruso died in 1983 before he could be questioned by investigators. Another suspect was a man named David Stone, who was arrested in 1987 in connection with the murder of a woman in Colorado. Stone had a criminal record that included violence against women, and he had been living in the Lewiston Clarkston area at the time of the murders. However, he was eventually cleared of any involvement in the Idaho cases. In recent years, there have been renewed efforts to solve the Idaho murders using advanced forensic techniques and DNA analysis. In 2019, investigators announced that they had identified a suspect in the case through genetic genealogy, a method that involves using DNA from crime scenes to create a family tree that can lead to the identification of a suspect. However, the identity of the suspect has not been publicly disclosed, and it is not clear if they will ever be brought to justice. The Idaho murders have had a profound impact on the communities of Lewiston and Clarkston, and on the families of the victims. The case has become a symbol of the enduring pain and frustration that comes with unsolved crimes, and has spurred efforts to improve law enforcement practices and victim support services. Number 4. Jacqueline Daolibi Jacqueline Daolibi was kidnapped in 1988 and her body was found a week later. The kidnapping and murder of Jacqueline Daolibi was a tragic and highly publicised case that rocked the small town of Midlothian, Illinois in 1988. Jacqueline was only seven years old at the time of her abduction and her death deeply impacted her family, friends and the local community. The night of the abduction, Jacqueline's parents awoke to find her missing from her bedroom. They immediately called the police, who launched an intensive search for the young girl. Sadly, a week later, her body was discovered in Blue Island, a neighbouring town, with a rope from the family's garage tied around her neck. 
The discovery of Jacqueline's body was devastating to her family and the community who were hoping for a happy ending to the search. The investigation into Jacqueline's abduction and murder was extensive and many suspects were considered and ruled out. However, the case took a dramatic turn when Jacqueline's father, David Dowlibi, was charged with her murder. The prosecution alleged that he had killed his daughter to cover up her assault. However, the evidence against him was largely circumstantial and many people in the community believed that he was innocent. Despite the doubts about David's guilt, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for Jacqueline's murder. However, he maintained his innocence throughout the trial and appeals process. In 1992, his conviction was overturned by an appeals court, citing insufficient evidence. The case was retried in 1994, but the jury was unable to reach a verdict and David was eventually acquitted. The kidnapping and murder of Jacqueline Dowlibi remains a haunting reminder of the fragility of life and the devastating impact of violent crime on families and communities. While a killer has never been caught, her memory lives on and her family and friends continue to seek justice for her tragic death. Despite the acquittal of Jacqueline's father, the case continued to generate controversy and speculation. Some people still believed that David was responsible for his daughter's death, while others felt that the police and prosecutors had mishandled the investigation and unfairly targeted an innocent man. Over the years, several theories and suspects have emerged in the case, but none have been definitively proven. In 2013, the case was reopened by the Midlothian Police Department, who hoped that advances in forensic technology might provide new leads. However, as of today, the case remains unsolved and Jacqueline's killer is still at large. Despite the lack of resolution in the case, the memory of Jacqueline Dowlibby continues to inspire hope and perseverance in those who remember her. Her family has established the Jacqueline Dowlibby Foundation, which works to support families of missing and exploited children and promote child safety. Number 3. La Salle Street Murders the La Salle Street murders are still unsolved more than 40 years later. The La Salle Street murders case has remained one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in Indiana for over four decades. On December 1, 1971, the bodies of three men were discovered inside a house located at 1318 North La Salle Street in Indianapolis. The victims, identified as 28-year-old Eugene Anderson, 28-year-old David Smith and 24-year-old William Simmons, had all been shot to death. The police investigation into the murders was extensive and involved interviewing numerous witnesses and collecting physical evidence from the crime scene. However, despite the efforts of law enforcement officials, the killer was never identified or apprehended. One of the primary challenges faced by investigators in the case was the large number of potential suspects. According to Captain Robert Snow of the Indianapolis Police Department, there were simply too many individuals who could have been responsible for the murders, making it difficult to narrow down the list of possible suspects. Over the years, various theories have been proposed about what may have happened on that fateful night in December 1971. Some have speculated that the killings were related to drug trafficking, while others have suggested that they may have been linked to organised crime. However, without any concrete evidence to support these theories, they remain mere conjectures. Despite the passage of time, the case has not been forgotten and law enforcement officials continue to search for any new leads or information that may help solve the crime. In recent years, advances in forensic technology have allowed investigators to re-examine the physical evidence collected from the crime scene and there remains a glimmer of hope that the case may one day be solved. However, until that day comes, the La Salle Street murders will continue to stand as a haunting reminder of a brutal crime that has gone unpunished for more than 40 years. The impact of the La Salle Street murders on the local community and the families of the victims has been significant. The brutal nature of the killings and the fact that the perpetrator has never been brought to justice has left a sense of unease and fear in the minds of many Indianapolis residents. The families of the victims have had to live with the pain of losing their loved ones in such a violent manner and without any closure. Over the years, there have been several attempts to reinvigorate the investigation into the murders. In 2011, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department created a new task force to look into the case, and in 2015, a $25,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer. Despite these efforts, however, the case remains unsolved. The La Salle Street murders have also become the subject of various books, documentaries, and podcasts. In 2021, the podcast Murder on the White River explored the case in depth and included interviews with surviving family members and law enforcement officials involved in the investigation. The continued interest in the case reflects the enduring fascination that unsolved crimes hold for many people. In conclusion, the La Salle Street murders stand as a grim reminder of the devastating impact that violent crime can have on individuals and communities. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement officials, the case remains unsolved, leaving a dark cloud of uncertainty hanging over the families of the victims and the wider Indianapolis community. Number 2. Stephen and Melissa 
The double homicide of Stephen Fisher and Melissa Gregory in 1983 is one of the most notorious unsolved murder cases in Iowa's history. The brutal crime shocked the small community of Newton, and despite numerous investigations and extensive media coverage, the killer has never been brought to justice. On March 3, 1983, Stephen Fisher and Melissa Gregory were brutally beaten to death with a blunt object on a ranch northwest of Newton, Iowa. The couple was found in the basement of the ranch, where they had been staying with friends. The murder weapon, believed to be a pipe wrench, was found at the scene, but no DNA or other physical evidence was found. The investigation into the double homicide was one of the largest in Iowa's history, with hundreds of interviews and leads pursued. Despite the efforts of law enforcement, the case went cold for more than 20 years. However, in 2007, a break in the case led to the arrest of Fisher's estranged wife, Terry Supino. Supino, who had been living in Arizona at the time of the murders, was charged with first-degree murder in 2007. The prosecution alleged that Supino had hired someone to kill Fisher because she was unhappy with their marriage and wanted to collect on his life insurance policy. However, the trial ended in a mistrial in 2009 when the jury was unable to reach a verdict. Supino was retried in 2015, and this time the jury found her not guilty. The defense argued that Supino had nothing to do with the murders and that the evidence against her was circumstantial. After the acquittal, the case remains unsolved, and the killer of Fisher and Gregory continue to evade justice. The case remains an open wound for the families of the victims and the community of Newton. The lack of closure has left many with unanswered questions and a sense of unease. Despite the passage of time, the hope for justice remains, and law enforcement continues to search for new leads and evidence that may finally bring the killer to justice. In the decades since the murders, there have been several theories and rumours about who could be responsible for the killings. Some have speculated that the killer was a local resident with a personal grudge against one or both victims. Others have suggested that the murders could have been connected to drug trafficking or organised crime. The case has also been the subject of numerous books, documentaries and podcasts, as well as a segment on the TV series Unsolved Mysteries. These efforts have helped to keep the case in the public eye and generate new leads and tips for law enforcement. In 2019, the Jasper County Sheriff's Office announced that they were partnering with a forensic genealogy company to use DNA analysis to try and identify the killer. The hope is that by using genetic genealogy, investigators may be able to identify potential suspects or family members of the killer through their DNA profiles. The use of genetic genealogy has been successful in other high-profile cold cases, such as the Golden State Killer and the arrest of a suspect in the 1992 murder of a teacher in Texas. However, it remains to be seen if this approach will lead to a breakthrough in the Fisher-Gregory case. As the case approaches its 40th anniversary, the families of the victims and the community of Newton continue to hold out hope for justice. Number 1. Kelly Lynn Albright In 1970, 12-year-old Kelly Lynn Albright went missing and was found dead in a field in Reno County. Four days after Kelly Lynn Albright disappeared from her family's home, she was found dead in a field. She had been violated and reportedly stabbed 18 times. A family friend named Glenn Davis was a suspect in the murder, but he was never charged due to lack of evidence. The case remained unsolved for decades, but in 2019, DNA evidence finally led to an arrest. Glenn Davis had been interviewed multiple times by police after Kelly Lynn Albright's murder, but he denied any involvement. However, in 2019, the Reno County Sheriff's Office was able to obtain a DNA sample from Davis through a search warrant. The DNA sample matched the DNA found on Kelly Lynn Albright's clothing and body, leading to Davis's arrest. He was charged with first-degree murder, violation, and aggravated violence. During his trial, Davis's defense team argued that the DNA evidence was contaminated or mishandled, and that there were other potential suspects in the case. However, the jury ultimately found him guilty on all counts and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The case of Kelly Lynn Albright's murder is a tragic example of the importance of DNA evidence in solving crimes. While it may take years or even decades, advances in forensic technology can help bring justice to victims and their families. The murder of Kelly Lynn Albright also highlighted the need for improved forensic techniques and investigative practices. At the time of her murder in 1970, DNA profiling did not exist, and investigators relied on less advanced methods of evidence collection and analysis. This made it more difficult to identify and prosecute perpetrators, and many cases went unsolved. However, advancements in forensic science, particularly in DNA profiling, have revolutionized criminal investigations and provided new avenues for identifying suspects and solving cold cases. DNA evidence has been instrumental in solving many high-profile cases, including the infamous Golden State Killer case, in which a serial rapist and murderer was identified and arrested decades after his crimes. Moreover, the case of Kelly Lynn Albright has also brought attention to the issue of assault and violence against children. 
Her brutal murder, as well as the high number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Kansas, has sparked calls for greater awareness and action to protect vulnerable populations and hold perpetrators accountable for their crimes. In conclusion, while the murder of Kelly Lynn Albright was a tragic and devastating event, it also brought attention to the importance of DNA evidence and the need for improved forensic techniques and investigative practices. It is important that we continue to support and invest in advancements in forensic science and criminal justice to ensure that perpetrators of violent crimes are held accountable and that justice is served for victims and their families.